one of the oldest myths, mythological stories out there, is the story of a hero named Gilgamesh. Sounds a little strange, right? So I'd like to tell you the story of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is a very interesting ancient tale that can, if we really think about it, teach us some interesting things about ourselves, human nature, but along the way we can also learn some words and phrases. So, let's talk about the story of Gilgamesh. I'm going to I'm going to tell the story along with some pictures. This story is sometimes called The Epic of Gilgamesh. And you may see this first slide here and think, "Oh no, He's died. He's already dead at the beginning. No, 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 no. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Okay, so the story of Gilgamesh. And what I'd like you to do as we, as I tell the story, what I'd really like you to think about along the way is, is there any other meaning? Is this just the story? Or is there anything else? Think about what symbols there might be. Think about what the story might be trying to tell you in a slightly deeper way. Does it have any other meaning? Okay, that's what I'd like you to do as I tell the story. Don't just take the immediate meaning that I say as exactly what's going on. There's, especially for ancient stories, especially for myths, there's always something going on below the surface. Okay, so without further delay, Let's get into the epic of Gilgamesh. Now, there was a king, all right? And the king's name, you may not be surprised, was Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh was a pretty terrible, pretty terrible king, honestly. He was rude, he was cruel, he did whatever he wanted. His people did not like him. In many ways, he was arrogant. He had all the power and none of the kindness. And so we start with a character, a hero, who's bad. So that's a strange place to start, right? Usually we start with a hero who's a good person. Luke Skywalker, an innocent boy who hasn't learned about the world. Here we're starting with a bad person, okay? A terrible king. A cruel king and I'm not even saying all of the stuff that he did because if I did then this video would be immediately banned <laughs> it would be blocked <laughs> so he did some really bad stuff he was a bad guy uh, behind my text here I think these are his people complaining oh the Gilgamesh she's bad ah. I think that's what they're doing I think that's why their their arms are up in this in this relief here they uh, all of them have their mouths open they're not happy they don't seem happy at all. I could be wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure. Now, the first sort of stage in this is the meeting of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, and how these two became friends, and how the friendship began the real journey, the real hero story of Gilgamesh. So the people hated their king, and they prayed to the gods. I don't know who the gods are. They're the gods. Okay, so they prayed to the gods. And the gods listened and said, oh, you want us to do something about that? Sure. Okay. So they created a being, a powerful being named Enkidu, who lived in nature, was in touch with nature, and was generally a good person, but kind of a wild, kind of a wild man, right? And Enkidu the gods thought was or could be the rival of Gilgamesh, the only one as powerful as Gilgamesh. That's why the gods created Enkidu. So Enkidu went to Enkidu went to Uruk to see what was going on, to see if he could confront this selfish king, because when he heard stories of all of the things that Gilgamesh did, he became angry. How could the people have a king like this? How could they let this happen? This is, this is awful. I have to do something about that, right? 
So, what happened was, he went to Uruk and there was a wedding, and Gilgamesh was going to be at the wedding. And he thought, oh, this is my chance. This is the chance that I have to confront this really bad dude. I have this drive, this hatred of this monster, Gilgamesh. And he did. He confronted him at the wedding in front of everybody. And Gilgamesh thought, who is this guy trying to, trying to confront me, trying to tell me that I'm a bad king? Outrageous. So they fought. They fought, and they fought, and they fought, and this is... This is them fighting. And as they fought, they shook the city because both of them are very powerful. Buildings fell down in the city because of their, their fighting. And they were very evenly matched. But finally, finally, Gilgamesh turned out to be slightly stronger than Enkidu. And he took advantage of Enkidu and wrestled him to the ground. Okay. Now, what happened after that? Well, what do you think happened? What happened was that Gilgamesh, having finally met someone who could tell him, you're a monster, you're bad, and I'm as powerful as you are. I'm not one of your subjects. I'm as strong as you, and I'm telling you that you're wrong. It forced Gilgamesh to realize that maybe that was true. He didn't completely change right away, but it made him recognize that someone as powerful as him could be on the other side, could be good. And so they became very close friends and their friendship was very important to each of them. They became like brothers. So what do, what do brothers do? As soon as you have a best friend, what do you do? You've got to do something together, right? So Gilgamesh said, after a while, we're friends now. And he was becoming a slightly, maybe slight, slightly better king we're friends now. Enkidu, what should we do to <laughs> honor our friendship? And Enkidu said, There is a horrible monster which guards the cedar forest far away from here, where humans are not allowed to go. Humans are not allowed to go to the cedar forest. This monster is called Humbaba. And I think that if we go there, we could kill Humbaba, this horrible, this horrible monster. And Gilgamesh said, yeah, that sounds great. That would be a great thing to do as friends. So now, now, friends just go shopping. Instead of going shopping, Gilgamesh and Enkidu decided to go kill a horrible monster in a cedar forest. <laughs> it's just what friends do. It's the same kind of thing. <laughs> instead, of, instead of going to the mall, they went to kill a monster. So... Before they left, they decided to get their weapons and see, see uh, Gilgamesh's mother. Now, I forgot to mention that Gilgamesh's mother was actually a goddess, a female god, a goddess. So, they went to his mother and Gilgamesh said, Hey, mom, this is my new best friend. He -he. His name is Enkidu. <laughs> We're friends. We're going to go kill Humbaba. <laughs> Sounds like a little kid, right? <laughs> Mom, we're going to go uh, kill Humbaba. This is my new best friend. We're going to go outside and play, <laughs> right? It sounds, it feels like that. It feels very uh, innocent and childish, even though it's this, these powerful people. It's very interesting, I think. Okay, so Gilgamesh's mother adopts Enkidu as her son. And so they become actual brothers their friendship is that deep she adopts him so they go off together with their weapons to the cedar forest and as they stand at the line between the cedar forest and outside the, the cedar forest they pause and Gilgamesh calls on the help of a god that he worships and asks his god, god of the sun, for guidance through the cedar forest. And then they step into the forest. And this forest is dark and scary and full of strangeness. And several days pass all along this sort of journey 
through the forest. As they pass through the forest, they start to feel more sort of nervous, a bit more afraid of the potential danger of this horrible, this horrible monster, Humbaba. Humbaba. Finally, they reach the place near a tall mountain where the largest tree, the largest pine tree or cedar tree was. And there they found the monster, Humbaba, a terrible monster. Now remember that Gilgamesh all along had been praying to this god, Shamash. I think it was Shamash. I could be wrong about that. And at that moment, Shamash told Gilgamesh when the right moment would be to strike and also created a distraction, some dust or something like that, or a cloud around Humbaba, this horrible creature, which allowed then Gilgamesh and Enkidu to attack the monster, to attack Humbaba and kill Humbaba, cut off Humbaba's head after a bit of a fight. So with the aid of the god that Gilgamesh prayed to, in this land where humans were not supposed to go, near the mountain, near the tallest cedar tree, they killed Humbaba. They cut down the largest cedar tree in the cedar forest. They thanked the god Shamash, the sun god, and then they took a boat, in fact the boat was made out of the tallest cedar, back to Uruk and celebrated. Now they were covered. Can you imagine going on a journey like this, killing a horrible monster without, there are no hotels in the forest, right? You're living outside by a fire, eating raw meat, who knows? No deodorant, no shampoo. They smelled really bad when they got back. So people were, ah, great heroes, but God, God take a shower, <laughs> right? <laughs> My God, you guys stink. We, we, we appreciate what you did. You're great, very powerful, but you smell. Go take a bath. That's what they said. That's what the people said. So they did. After killing this monster, bringing its head back, and, and cutting down the tallest cedar, took a shower and put on some nice clothes. Right, some, maybe some velvet robes. I don't know. I don't know what they were wearing. As they are celebrating in their nice robes, a goddess is watching from, from heaven. And her name is Ishtar. She's the daughter of a very powerful god. And she goes to Gilgamesh and she says to Gilgamesh, listen, Gilgamesh, you smell nice. And you're very handsome. Your robes are very nice. You're a very powerful man. I am a goddess. So I'm, I'm obviously more powerful than you are, but for a man, not bad. You look good. I like how you look. I want you to be my husband. Gilgamesh knew all about Ishtar. Ishtar had a history of killing her husbands for no reason. <laughs> because she got in a bad mood or whatever. So, he said to Ishtar, to a goddess, No, get out of here. I refuse. You think that has ever happened before? A, a, a mortal human refusing a beautiful goddess to make you her husband? No, no. She was so furious. She was absolutely beside herself with anger. So she went back up to heaven and talked to her father, who's a powerful god, and said to her father, Father, I am very angry about Gilgamesh who has rejected me and I want you to kill him. And her father said, well, you know, you kind of, uh, you kind of deserve it because, you know, everybody knows that you, you kill all your husbands. And so, uh, you, you kind of deserve it. He was kind of like a, a father in that way, giving some tough love to his daughter. But she said, Dad, please, you know, they want to kill him. And so he said, all right, fine. We will send the bull of heaven down. And 
The bull of heaven can do what it wants, but you know, the bull of heaven is a very powerful bull, which is a cow, and it, surely it will kill Gilgamesh. So she said, oh, oh, okay, I guess that's good enough. Then re they released the bull of heaven, which came down and thundered on, on the land and cracked the city open. People were falling into cracks in the ground in the city, dying by the hundreds. And so, thank you, do. And Gilgamesh said, "We gotta, we gotta kill that bull. We gotta take that bull out. That bull is gonna kill everyone in the city." Now, notice, there seems to be a bit more responsibility here going on, protecting the city from an outside danger. Hmm. Would he have done that before? Maybe. Maybe not. Something for you to think about. So, Enkidu and, Gilgame and Gilgamesh kill the bull of heaven. They grab it by the tail and they cut off its head and cut off other pieces of it as well. And Ishtar is very upset, but there's nothing that she can do. They've killed the bull of heaven. She can't go to her father anymore. And in fact, Gilgamesh slaps her with a piece of the bull. So she's very upset that Gilgamesh has basically slapped a goddess with a big chunk of the bull of heaven. I think it was the bull of heaven's leg, maybe. And that's obviously a big insult. And while the gods, or rather her father, say, uh, we're not going to help anymore with, uh, with that, we also can't let these humans get too arrogant. They went into the cedar forest. They weren't supposed to go there. They killed Humbaba, a powerful creature that we created. They cut down the tallest cedar in the forest. They killed the bull of heaven. They slapped his daughter with a piece of meat. <laughs> this is not okay. And so they finally decided after talking together, well, something has to be done. So at that time, Enkidu got sick, very sick. And over a period of days, he got sicker and sicker and he died. Obviously, that made Gilgamesh extremely sad. Gilgamesh was beside himself with despair and sadness about the loss of his friend, Enkidu. First time he'd had someone who was his equal, a brother, now is dead. Maybe killed by his own actions because the gods saw the, these little humans behaving in a way that was arrogant and they thought, we need to do something to take them down one level so that they realize and remember that they're just humans and they are not like us powerful gods, right? And so, he became so depressed that he said, I don't want to be king anymore. I'm going to leave Uruk. I'm so sad about my friend Enkidu. I'm going to put on animal skins instead of nice clothes and I'm going to leave the city. And that's what he did. He wandered aimlessly and in his aimless wandering he thought deeply about what his life was what his life had been about the meaning of life about the meaning of death some deep things and finally realized that his goal or a very good goal would be immortality and he thought okay i don't want to be like my friend enkidu I feel guilty that it might be my fault, partially, that Enkidu was was killed by the gods. But at the same time, I don't want to turn out like that. Enkidu's death has reminded me of my own mortality. And I would like to I would like to live forever. Sounds pretty good. So he decided to try to achieve immortality. How do you do that? Well, you would go to, if you knew about another human who had done it you would go to that person, right? If you heard that there was a, 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 an old man living across the sea, the sea of death, who had achieved immortality, and you wanted to get that, that's probably where you'd go. And he had heard of such a person named Utnapishtim. Utnapishtim. Now, Utnapishtim is kind of like Noah, if you know the story of the Bible, the guy who built the boat and survived on the boat during the Great Flood. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about how Utnapishtim did that, but he is that kind of character. 
And after that whole thing that happened with the flood on the boat, the gods gave him immortality because he saved all humanity. But he lived across the sea, which was on the other side of a tall mountain, through some gates. And so Gilgamesh traveled very far to, to this mountain. And he crossed over the mountain. Finally, after getting through these gates, he was asked some questions by the guardians of the gates. He passed through, went over the mountain, and found himself, bizarrely, at a kind of bar or tavern or pub where he met someone who was like a goddess named Siduri. Siduri is the goddess of the goddess of wine and drinking and I think wisdom and other things as well. Usually gods and goddesses have different different roles, right? So he met he met Siduri. Siduri is the person running this tavern. Don't ask me why a, a goddess would be running a tavern. It sounds like a kind of a, a fairly low level uh, low level profession, but that that's what she was doing. And he asked her, how can I achieve immortality? And she said, you're on the right track, but if you want to get to Utnapishtim, this immortal man, you have to cross the Sea of Death. And in order to do that, you have to find a boatman or someone who can take you over the sea. The only person I know is someone who lives near the sea who knows a lot about boats, and his name is Urshanabi. So, Gilgamesh said, oh, thanks a lot, I appreciate it. I'm going to go find Urshanabi. And I think they had a drink together. They may have had a beer together. And then Gilgamesh left Siduri after she gave him the advice and went to find Urshanabi, the boat person. Okay, so Urshanabi met Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh explained the situation. Urshanabi said no. He gave him several tasks, which Gilgamesh had to complete. We don't need to go into that, but he had to do some trials. And then, with the wood that they gathered together, Urshanabi and Gilgamesh built a boat. And they went across the sea to the place where Utnapishtim, this old guy who was immortal, who had achieved immortality, lived. And he said to, he said to Gilgamesh, who are you? Kind of in a disinterested way, right? Not that interested in, uh, not that interested in Gilgamesh. This is just some guy, you know, who cares about you? And Gilgamesh asked about his story. He said, how did you achieve immortality? How did you become the great Utnapishtim? And can you tell me how? Because that's what I want. And... Utnapishtim said, if you want to achieve immortality, you have to do something great. What I did was a long, long time ago, I found out from a god who told me that the world was going to end by a flood. Instead of just letting it happen, I decided that I would build a great boat and save myself and some of those around me. And as a result of that, everyone else was killed, except for me and those around me. I saved humanity. I had children, their children, their children, their children. Because of that, I was given immortality. So he finally, after a conversation with Gilgamesh, says, if you want to be immortal, you have to stay awake for seven days. First, step one some trials sort of like the boat except now it's about immortality stay awake for seven days he said Gilgamesh said okay fine I'm gonna stay awake for seven days immediately he he fell asleep so he failed right away right at the start of his trial he fell asleep and so obviously he was stupid 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 Gilgamesh why did I do that angry at himself of course he then said, is there anything else I can do? And Utnapishtim said, well, there is a plant at the bottom of the sea that can make life much, much longer. It can prolong your life, maybe indefinitely. So if you get that plant at the bottom of the sea, you will be able to live a very, very long life. 
And he said, okay, that sounds good. That's the best I can do. Maybe not immortality, but at least I can live a very, very long life. So he said, thank you, Utnapishtim. And Utnapishtim said, yeah, get out of here. Don't come back. So he left with the boatman, Urshanabi. They got on the boat. And in the middle of the sea, when they were right in the middle, Gilgamesh put some stones around his feet and <gasps> held his breath and sank down, 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 down to the bottom of the sea grabbed some of this magical plant at the bottom of the sea and then came up <gasps> with this plant. So now he thought, I have at least this plant. All of my journeys, all of my travels, my sadness and my despair, at least I have this thing I can bring back. But his first thought was, I will give it to the elders of Uruk when I get home. I will have some for myself as well. But his first thought was, I will give it to the elders of the city of Uruk, the older people, maybe the important people in the city. And so he and the boatman started to go back together. He invited the boatman to come back with him to the city, to Uruk. And so they started going back. And on their way, at some point, he was taking a bath in a small pool. He had the plant, the special magical plant, beside the pool. And while he was bathing, a snake, a snake came up. And the snake took the plant. It slithered away with the plant as he was bathing and disappeared. And I can't remember if the, the snake ate the plant or just disappeared with the plant. But anyway, the plant was lost. And for whatever reason, Gilgamesh couldn't go back to the sea and get more of it that's not so clear but he couldn't go back and so he had to return to the city of Uruk with nothing so he and the boatman Urshanabi came back to Uruk empty handed this long journey going across the sea of death meeting Siduri meeting Utnapishtim the important person who saved humanity after all of this come back with nothing now the question is is that true did he come back with nothing or did he come back with wisdom the wisdom that might allow him to be a good king now the experience of trying something of failing of having friendship of working hard to do something, to get something, of fighting the bull of heaven to protect his city, right? Of, of having a purpose in life. At first, immortality, and then later, maybe, just the well-being of his, his city, maybe. So, it's up for interpretation, but think about it. Did he come back with something, or did he come back with nothing and was this journey that he took valuable and what other things can we learn from the story of Gilgamesh so let me know what you think about the story let me know what you think about the story of Gilgamesh in the comments I would be very interested if you have any insights or thoughts about the story if you've heard other versions and you'd like to share those details comments let me know in the comments if you haven't already guys make sure you hit the like button Make sure that you subscribe, and if you haven't already done so, make sure to check out my full courses in the links in the description. Thanks for listening.